Good afternoon, I'm Donald Morris, um, and I have my guest today, Martin Lodge from Waikato, Professor of Music. He is part of our, um, what we call NZBBC interview series. NZBBC stands for New Zealand Baby Boomer Composers, mm -hmm. and that is the generation born between the, the mid-1940s and the mid-1960s. Um, so we've got quite a lot of composers in New Zealand from that era. And so we're really delighted to have you here today, Martin, and welcome. Thank you. Just a few words about Martin by way of introduction. While he's best known as a composer, Martin is also a scholar and commentator on music. In 1990 and 1991, Martin held the Mozart Fellowship at the University of Otago, and in 1993, he was a composer in residence with the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra. Martin has been a member of several international advisory boards, and at present he is a member of the editorial board for Promethean University Editions Music Scores. Martin is Director of Composition of Studies at Waikato University, and his principal teaching areas are Composition, Studies in New Zealand Music, and Music Aesthetics. In 1997, he initiated an innovative course on New Zealand music, which covers traditional Maori music and popular music, as well as New Zealand composition in the classical Western tradition. He followed this initiative up by planning and leading the introduction of a complete stream of Maori music studies in the Waikato Bachelor of Music degree in collaboration with colleagues in the University School of Māori and Pacific Development, where the courses are taught. In 2016, the University officially received a magnificent 50-piece collection of traditional Māori instruments that Martin commissioned from a team of makers led by the authoritative carver Brian Flintoff. Now to my first question for Martin. First of all, where were you born? And can you tell us about your family background in terms of music, did you have siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, parents? What was it like in your household? <clears throat> yes, I was born in Tauranga and spent my first 18 years there. I guess there were several formative acoustic or audible influences. One was the sounds of daily life in the house, um, people moving around and talking. It was quite a large family, so I was the, I am, the eldest of five plus parents. So it was a small house with a lot of people in it, <laughs> so there was a lot of noise. Um, my mother was a pianist, quite a useful sort of domestic pianist, so she would play things like movements of Mozart sonatas, simpler Chopin, um, and some sort of Victorian parlour favourites like Rustle of Spring by Cindy. Uh, she was also um, heavily involved with music in the church, and she sang in the church choir and learned organ from the choir master, I think. But she never seemed to play religious music at home so much. Um, not sure why not. Uh, the other influence that I remember very much was the radio going a lot, and it was always on commercial radio. So I grew up hearing a huge amount of pop music from the 60s in particular. Um, so the Beatles were a formative influence, I would say. And later in my teens, groups like Led Zeppelin. And it wasn't until my mid to late teens that the world of classical music opened, and that was like a huge gust of fresh air. Um, music would be so much more than what I'd already experienced. But all those things are part of the mix. Sure. And I guess the other thing I would say is um, the sound of nature. There was a huge pruriri tree, probably hundreds of years old, growing in the house next door in Tauranga. And it was full of birds of all kinds, mm -hmm. and the kind of song they made vary depending on the time of day, the dawn chorus, the evening chorus, migratory patterns. So there was a lot of bird song also growing up. What about learning an instrument? When did you learn an instrument? And when? At what age? Yeah, was my mother, bless her, tried to make me learn the piano when I was young, which I did for a while, and then I rebelled and thought, no, that's not for boys, and um, refused to learn it stupidly, and then had to go back and relearn it a bit when I was in my late teens by which time it's too late to be really any good as a pianist. So I'm a terrible pianist. Mm -hmm. uh, later I learned the violin as well. Um, and I still play the viola a little bit, but not in public for public safety reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, when did you realise you wanted to be a composer or to compose music? I think um, I always wanted to create music and make sounds, even when I didn't have the means to, to do them. And, um, I had an uncle who was, went on to become a very skillful engineer designing surgical instruments, 
and he had made his own musical instruments out of all sorts of old bits and pieces. And so this idea of using what you find or found sound became quite influential as well. Mm -hmm. The instruments he made weren't re really very wonderful acoustically, but they were interesting. Mm -hmm. And I guess that helped feed him to this interest in sound as such that they had and how you could make it do things. So do you remember when you first put pen to paper and yeah, wrote, I didn't wrote really, down a piece? Yes, I don't remember what it was, but I know it was no good. <laughs> I was at a time when I was also doing some paintings and writing some poems and things at school. I've still got a few of my old oil paintings hanging mm -hmm. around somewhere. Um, but then I decided really, um, well, it was, there were a few influential people, as there often are, who determine one's trajectory. And at secondary school, um, I had a really interesting music teacher called Bob Addison, who was um, an operatic tenor. And uh, he had a way of running music in the Otomotai College that I went to in Tauranga, which was really uh, inclusive. So he got the first 15 into the choir, and then suddenly music became really cool. <laughs> and he put on a lot of musicals. Um, and he also talked about music in class in a way that was really um, not bound by genre. So he reached out to the kids in the class by talking about the latest pop music, the new Beatles release or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But then we'll play a movement from a Mozart symphony and talk about that without discrimination, so it was a really open-minded view. Um, and he was the moving force behind the building of Baycourt Theatre in Tauranga, which is the main venue now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the auditorium is named after him, it's the Addison mm -hmm. Auditorium. So I was really lucky in that regard. What, what do you remember as a primary school in music? I don't remember much about music at primary school. Singing the national anthem, I think, was one thing. No <laughs> <laughs> longer so popular. Um, I was reflecting on that this morning, and I think one of the main musical memories I have is actually singing the math um, tables of multiplication, mm -hmm. because it was much easier for kids to remember multiplying two times two is four, two, three is a six, and chant them or sing them rather than just try and memorize them. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of mnemonic aid. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my strongest mm -hmm. memory, oddly enough. So when you finished high school, did you make a decision then you were going to go to university and do music? Well, at high school, I had another very, two influential people played a part. One was my sixth form, which is year 12 now, I think, mm. um, teacher of English was Peter Shaw, who was his first year after Teachers College, and he was very fresh and lively, and he was a fantastic English teacher. And of course, he's since gone on to be a music critic and mm -hmm. art historian and an architectural historian. Um, so he was inspirational, and up till that point, I'd actually been studying mostly science. And at this late point in schooling, I suddenly realized, wow, I really like the arts, and particularly English and music. So, and so it was, well, it was Peter who actually, mm -hmm. in one of his after hours, um, sort of soiree things that he had at his house with his wife, Coral, who's now an eminent retired judge. Um, she, at the time, she was a primary school teacher in Tauranga, and um, he uh, would play all sorts of music, and that's where the big revelation happened, that it was playing Act One of Die Valkyrie of Wagner, mm -hmm. and suddenly it was like this blast of polar air, and I suddenly woke up and thought, I always imagined music would do something like that, but I didn't know what it was, and now I do know, and I could go out to that garden of real music at last. So what influenced you to which university you would go and study music? Well, the first person who influenced me not to study music straight away was Vincent O'Sullivan, mm -hmm. <laughs> who was um, recruiting for Waikato University, which was new at the time. And he came round to the schools, and he was a very cool poet of black turtleneck mm -hmm. um, jersey, and gave an amazing presentation and said he was teaching at Waikato University. So I went there and studied English Lit first, mm -hmm. and right through to master's level with Vincent and some other remarkable teachers. For example, the lecturer in um, Shakespeare and Joyce had worked at Bletchley Park as a code breaker. He's an absolutely genius kind of eccentric Welshman mm -hmm. <laughs> called John Dernley. So we had a wonderful okay. school, a group of people. But I always knew I wanted to study music after the literary yes. studies. And so, I, so what did you do? So I looked around to see where the composers were working that I admired, and that was Victoria. And Douglas Lilburn and David Farquhar were the names I knew from listening to records of their music. So I uh, came here and uh, studied with them and Ross Harris. I'd love to hear the experience of working with these people. 
What are your memories? Well, Douglas was right at the end of his teaching life. He retired a little bit early and he was a formidable person. Um, he didn't teach technically at all. In fact, there was hardly any technique. It was all about experience and thinking about music um, and digging into it. And he said, uh, he taught by example, I would say. And I do admire so much his integrity as sticking to his guns against quite a lot of opposition and misapprehension. Mm -hmm. um, and at this stage, the electronic music studio was well established. It was, and that was the course in particular I did with him, was electronic music. Yeah. And he didn't play much of his own, only on the very last day. He played actually his last completed piece, Soundscape with Lake and River. Mm -hmm. And we had that treat of him saying, oh, I've just finished something, yeah, yeah. <laughs> playing it in class. Mm -hmm. But it was remarkable to watch him fumble with a tape recorder and mm -hmm. struggle just to get the tapes to turn, let alone manipulate all this equipment. Mm -hmm. so, he must have really wrestled with it, I think. So you didn't do instrumental composition with him as such? No, that was with David Farquhar right. and Ross Harris. Right. Would you want to tell us a bit about that? Well, they were such diverse personalities. Yes. Douglas was a very thoughtful, um, powerful personality. He spoke in sort of epithets, really. I remember once asking him about Tony Watson and said, why did this tragic composer Tony Watson commit suicide at the age of 39? Mm -hmm. And he thought for a moment and said, he couldn't live without booze, couldn't compose with it. And I thought, that's actually, the more I've got to know about it, that's a brilliant answer. Mm. Mm. So he, does, he wasn't a, a very conversational person in some mm. ways, mm. Uh, except on special occasions. But David Farquhar, on the other hand, was a very urbane, quite a charming person, but very much a meticulous craftsman. And he regarded teacher of music and composition as a craft. Mm -hmm rather than as being sort of Beethovenian artists. So it was a really different view of learning music and what it meant to be a composer. Right. And Ross Harris, what sort of influence would you feel from him? I became quite close friends with Ross, so that was a special relationship. And um, of course his great thing was species counterpoint, <laughs> note against note, working out exactly how the minute of music works, which actually I've inherited and I torment my own students with it to this day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it really does give you a, a, an amazing insight into especially tonal music, the nuts and bolts. And then right at the end of my time, I think Jack Body joined the staff in the last year, who was again such a different personality. So can we talk about national identity? And oh, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, the way I've framed my question here, what does it mean in relation to music in general, in relation to New Zealand Aotearoa? and in relation to your own music, or is it irrelevant and unimportant to your approach and composition? Well, I think it's a really problematic question, because um, I don't think we have identity as a singular anymore. People have identities, mm -hmm. um, so we have different ways of facing the world, or interacting with the world, depending on context. <coughs> and I think as composers we do that. Uh, my PhD thesis was proposing that there is no a meta design or overarching way of approaching um, a view of a compositional style or language, which was contradicting what I had learned as an avant-garde trained student. But today everyone composes, well, many of us compose each piece with a different set of paradigms depending on the circumstances. So it's a much more pragmatic approach, I think, and it's quite a big change. So, um, what does identity mean in that? Well, it means it's changing all the time and evolving. And I don't see any problem with that, really. I ask you specifically for you because you did work with Douglas Lil Burnham. Yeah. He is the one who said back in 1947, we have to establish an identity. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wondered to what degree he tried to draw that out of his students to, to encourage them to have something to identify with New Zealand. Or at that point, was he just find yourself? I never got that kind of stricture from him. It was always just try and pursue your own vision. Mm -hmm. It's really what I'm, or being true to yourself mm -hmm. is what I got from him. Um, I don't even think about it anymore, actually. I don't worry about it. Yeah. Do you think he was still trying to find, for, in his own composition, a national identity in his later years, or had he given up that himself? I suspect he, he was, especially the integration of natural sounds yeah. into his electronic pieces. So if you use the sound of the landscape or the soundscape around you then it's got to be redolent of a place mm -hmm. whether you 
planned in some structural way or not. Mm -hmm. But human beings, have got, we've all got much more in common than we have differences if we dig beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's what Douglas meant when he said, um, if you want to make a universal statement first, find the truth of your own village. I think it's in the same mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. which is a quote from some Yates, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, there's a lot of truth in that, I think. Mm -hmm. If you're true to the detail, then the bigger picture of it, to some extent, looks after itself. Yeah. So I mentioned in the introduction your, your interest in development of, of Maori traditional instruments uh, in the classroom as part of our history, but also can we lead into how that influenced your composition or how it came into your own composition? Can you talk a little about that? That was something I really had no um, intention of pursuing and didn't know anything about. It was really through personal contacts. So when I was studying James Joyce's Ulysses, it was a whole year paper in my MA in English Literature with this crazy, wonderful Welshman um, who went through it page by page. Uh, there was a small master's class and we met in the lecturer's home at Waikato University. And one of the people in that group was this huge Viking with a huge red hair and beard who was an English teacher at Melville High School in Hamilton. And his name was Richard Nubbs. And he joined the group as a bibliophile and wannabe Joyce scholar. <laughs> and so I got to know him then. And in one of those strange circularities of fate, he reappeared many years later in his reincarnation as the premier you know, exponent of Tangapuru. Mm. And so I um, actually caught up with him when I was at Otago University and he asked if I'd arrange a session for him and here in Melbourne to introduce these instruments that no one knew about. This was in 1990. So we did that and that's how I got to meet Hirini. And in another circle of fate, I ended up being his colleague back at Waikato University. So it was through those people really that familiarity came and Richard kept pestering me to write him a piece for these instruments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was quite nervous about it. So then he said, well, just do it and trust the people we were working with. So I ended up writing a piece called Toro, for, meaning three in Maori, for Richard Nunns and Peter Scholes, who's a wonderful clarinetist and improviser, and James Tennant, the cellist and improviser. And uh, that proved to be a kind of turning point. It worked because of the brilliant performances they gave. And it gave me a confidence after that. And a growing interest in the, um, in the Maori world. I suppose there's also the fact that two sides of my family now are Maori. And one with the Whanganui connection and another with Arawa and Tuhoi and Rotorua. So my grandson's Maori. Mm -hmm. And um, when it becomes more immediate and in the whanau, you take more personal interest mm -hmm. in it, I guess. So when you first were writing for these instruments, did you leave a lot of room for improvisation? And has that remained that way? Or have you become someone who notates more and more? What's the trajectory been? I, I did a lot of reading about it, and I read Mervyn McLean's book on Maori music and um, really disagreed with a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And I know Richard did as well. We had a lot of talks about it. So the idea of notating music or Maori music, particularly on a stave, with its implications of equal temperament and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing, seemed really a betrayal of the tea camera of the instruments. And so um, the idea of, on the other hand, of just leaving it open to free improv has also seemed to be wrong to me. And I gradually realised that um, if you provide a structure and leave the detail to the performer, the Tongapuro performer isn't actually improvising there composing on the spot according to quite a clear set of rules and expectations and history that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's not really like improvisation, it's mm -hmm. like a guided, spontaneous composition part for the Tom Porter player. Yeah. But uh, whether two groups come together, the Western instruments and Maori instruments, I tend to write out fully notated Western parts because a lot of Western players are not comfortable mm -hmm. improvising. Um, so the question then is, how do they come together? And at this year's Nelson Composer Workshop, there's quite a heated, dis or a lively discussion about um, some pieces that had Tongapura and Western instruments, mm -hmm. and whether the pieces were true to either instrument or just some kind of sad melange, really. And my answer to that was, don't think of them as trying to blend or mix, but think of it as in the, the piece as the space for encounter. And it's up to the listener to mm -hmm. find the connections. So when I write, I don't expect the Tongapuro to blend in or necessarily, or to tune in with the 
Leicester instruments. It's up to the Tom Porter player. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, if it clashes in his grittiness, that's fine as well, because that's the way life is sometimes. So did part of this process involve you learning to play the Tom Porter yourself? I do have a little yeah. collection and yeah. I tried to play them and yeah. I still try and I asked Richard to give me some lessons and he was extremely rude, <laughs> as old friends can be. <laughs> and uh, in the end he said, you just have to live with them and let, find the voice of the instrument. Yeah. So you know, a lot of these instruments have, uh, the wind instruments have two uh, noses on the far end of them and one represents the player and the breath of the player and the other represents the voice of the instrument and when they come together, that's when the music happens. So as the players, we have to become familiar with each instrument. Right. And each one's individual, of course, they're not standard art. Well, you've got a piece that we're going to have a listen to and a look at. Can okay. you just introduce it before we put it on? Tell us so, what it's going to be. Oh, uh, that's Horomaro Horo, who's a friend and performer um, of Tamakoro. And this is a piece called Ahuna, which means um, join together and face forward. And it was a piece, an occasional piece written to welcome this collection of 50 odd instruments, uh, traditional instruments, to the University of Waikato. So it brings together a piano trio, which is the New Zealand Chamber Soloist, and Tom Apuro. Um, we're going to see a little clip from about two thirds of the way through to the end. So this is Horomono about to play a kind of challenge fanfare on the putata, and I always think that's an interesting instrument because the first exchange between Europeans and Maori was. Dutch naval bugles from Tasman ships and the Putatara from the shore mm -hmm. and of course it led to the catastrophic musical misunderstanding <laughs> and slaughter the next day. So music is not a universal language. Um, but it's really interesting to have these instruments brought in to a kind of concert piece situation. So we'll hear uh, the Putatara and then some other instruments play out to the end of the piece. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, you mentioned when you were young that you listened to the Beatles. Yeah. I'm just interested to hear right through your life what other kinds of musics have you been drawn to um, at various stages of your life and what do, you, what do you listen to to relax? Well, the composer I never get tired of listening to is Debussy. Uh -huh. I think it's one of the most remarkable and wonderful composers. In fact, I'm reading the latest biography by Stephen Walsh of him at the moment. It's just, there's always new things to say about Debussy. The other composer I go back to is the greatest of us all, which is Bach, of course. <laughs> There's always things to think about and enjoy in Bach. So I listen widely. Mm -hmm. For pleasure also, I like to listen to new music, something I haven't heard before. Mm -hmm. Outside the Western genre, you listen to? Um, not so much. Yeah. No, so much to hear in our own backyard. Really. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, all the pieces you've composed, can you just take us through a few that really stand out as being very special to you for some reason or other? I guess Toro is special because that was the first one for Tongapuro and Western instruments. Um, another one which was a commission a few years, just about three years ago, was for solo cello, <clears throat> written for a wonderful German cellist. Um, and that was a chance to really focus on the hyper virtuoso technique for solo instrument and think what was I going to do with it. Mm. So I decided to build some coded messages into it um, about my own self and my past. And so it starts with a coded version of the performer's name, um, Schmidt, and then it goes, has Bach's name, B-A-C-H, the famous motive. But then I insert an E to it. So Bach goes to the beach because I grew up on the Pacific coast. <laughs> so if anyone wants to decode the beast, um, I've got a lot of cryptic clues in it, but you don't need to know that to listen to it. <laughs> I find that kind of fun to do. Yeah. Well, that leads me actually to the next question. Have you experimented with any composition techniques and then abandoned them? Yeah, I, quite a lot. Yeah. And the Tell old... us about that. <laughs> oh, you know, things like uh, pitch class sets and all that kind of thing, which um, are very helpful as kind of templates for getting stuff done. But I've come around to more and more asking myself a question which we were never encouraged to ask as students, which is when you're writing, that's all very well, but who's listening? And that's the more and more I'm asking myself, who's listening? And in the world we live in, there is no mainstream of anything really with the internet and the fragmented kind of lifestyle and YouTube and Facebook and all these things providing echo chambers for each person's ego. So people like what they know and know what they like and get into these circular little bubbles. So who is listening and why is a really difficult question to answer. So I try to write now for, what would I say, the intelligent non-specialist, someone who has open ears and an open heart, but isn't a musician necessarily, someone who's just willing to listen and have an experience. So I'm tending to write simpler, more approachable music now with tunes and all those mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. one didn't in one's 20s. Mm -hmm. So what would be the most avant-garde kind of thing you've done in your compositions? The, <laughs> for my honours year, <laughs> as a student, I produced a piece on one huge piece of paper about this size, which was composed entirely of quotes, some musical, some from literature, some from philosophy, and a spiral. Mm -hmm. And the, I called it um, something like a new piece for piano or something provocative like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the examiners who was a, someone who became a dear friend, Elizabeth Kerr, said, Martin, I have to ask you, are you pulling our legs? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, it's serious, just think about it. <laughs> but that's as far as I went in that time. Yeah, yeah. So the, the gradual thing over your life has been to become actually more conservative. I don't know, well, conservative, con well, conservative in the sense of conserving things which are good. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're not innovative. Yeah, either. sure. In fact, innovation has been defined as finding new relationships between things, because no one creates anything new. No. No. We're just rearranging things. So, if you had to define the things about your compositions that make you unique, that make you, ah, that's Martin Lodge, what sort of things would you identify? It's probably someone else should answer that, really, rather than me. Um, I think constant change is one of the things. So, there's no, it's hard to predict what the next piece will sound like on the basis of what came before. Um, about two years ago, I did a project in Shanghai in China and uh, commissioned and produced a, an album of new music for string quartet. So the composers from 
China, US, India, and New Zealand, and myself was one of the New Zealand composers. And the theme for linking that whole album was flow, because that's the idea of constant change and nothing staying the same is common to all cultures and all human life, regardless of anything else. And I think that's actually at the essence of it. If you can accept change and flow, um, then life becomes a lot more pleasant. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm working towards through music as well, constant change. So my last question before we open it to the floor is oh. the future. What's, what's on the books? What's coming up? What are you working on? What I'm working on now is after a number of little short pieces, um, going back to my big piece, which is a viola concerto called Spring Wind. So this um, is written at the request of Timothy Dyden, who's a wonderful violist based in Pennsylvania. He's played quite a bit of my music before and has been incredibly patient with his commission. <laughs> it's been several years now. Um, but I was actually talking to Witty Hamaya a few years ago about, catch we had a catch up, and he said, um, well, you should make something, some of these events in your life, particularly getting very ill and having a near-death experience. And um, I thought, well, that's probably right. I hadn't thought of it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what this concerto is about. So I commissioned Vincent O'Sullivan, who of course I met in the sixth form of school originally, and then he lectured me, and he's now such a distinguished poet. I asked him if he'd write me two poems for the concerto. Um, so one is about death, and the other one at the end of the work is about rebirth and life renewing itself. So this will be sung by a choir, so it's a concerto for solo viola, orchestra and choir on the theme of the cyclical nature of things and change. Mm -hmm. So that's, I really need to get back and work on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open the questions to the floor. Anyone would like to ask a question? If Martin, this is the moment to do it. Um, in my limited knowledge, there's only two concertos, the other concertos actually, which have, which have a choir, uh, one by Alan Bush and one by Bussoni. Um, so what constitutes a thing of a choir in the, in the concerto? Partly it was wanting to incorporate words, <laughs> um, so these texts are very special because they're written for me. Um, but the other, I suppose, influence was thinking, you know, there's so many concertos in the world, even quite a few viola concertos, what can make it different? So I looked at one, which is a wonderful one that Donald may know, written for um, an Israeli violist, which is, incorporates um, a tango in the last movement and um, electric violin imitating the Harley Davidson doing a drag race in the middle. And I thought, well, that's pretty out there. Um, but I want to do something a little bit more serious, <laughs> but also distinctive. So, you know, there's a lot of musical noise in the world, so to create a piece which finds a place and a voice that someone may remember, it has to be special in some way, and this is one way to do it, is to make it for an unusual force. And I love choral sounds too, it's a wonderful mixture of choir and orchestra, so I haven't written for that ensemble before, <clears throat> so um, first time. You've spoken uh, very eloquently about your experience as a student. Mm -hmm. It's one thing if you could perhaps tell us a little bit about your approach to teaching. Approach to teaching, yeah. I suppose I really followed Douglas's example and um, teach as much technique as is needed to get students to um, be able to proceed and find their own voices. I think it's, a, it's very easy for teachers to talk about technique at length, because we know it all by the time we get to our age, and teachers can talk too much, I think. Um, I know I can, if given the chance. <laughs> um, but it's good for students, I think, to be able to um, be inspired to find their own way and um, be shown an example of how to do it. So I do talk about what I'm working on, which um, I regret my teachers didn't in general. David Farquhar never talked about what he was working on. And Ross usually didn't either, um, and Douglas only at the end. But when they did, it was very exciting and made everything very immediate. So that's something I like to bring in. So here's something I've written. It hasn't been performed yet. We'll play the, you know, this electronic um, audio of it so they get a feel, and then they can go to the concert and see the piece come together and hear the ups and downs of it all too. Because these things usually don't run smoothly. There's, there are things to do. So um, I try to make it 
the teaching process kind of uh, alive and not just a, here's the knowledge, I'm going to pour it in, because I don't think that's appropriate. And also the age we live in of the internet and rapid change means um, we all have to retrain ourselves to be constantly learning and I think next generations will certainly have to do that. So if you need tools, you go out and find them, learn them and do that job. The main thing is to have the confidence to take on the job in the first place, which is you know, being confidence in your own imagination, really. No. Yeah? Hello. Uh, you were talking about um, when you were growing up about you know, sounds around the house and um, yes. your mum playing um, works up on the piano. Um, was that reflected in your music as a craft after, after the fact? And if so, how, how did you incorporate that? I think the fact that I heard it around the house mixed up with other things like cooking noise and people having an argument in the room next door, maybe the Beatles coming through from my sister's room, <laughs> meant that um, everything seems to be able to find a place. And I think categorising things by genre and saying, well, this happens there, but not there. Like you only listen to Mozart in the concert hall, you know, with your eyes closed and a revere sort of reverence, is a kind of a death sentence, really. For, if we want to keep music alive, and that's the most important thing, then the repertoire has to be alive with us and changing as well. The way we listen has changed. So the way I think of music is as a living thing, not as a museum thing. And if people play, you know, as Imogen Hall said, if things worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So it's more important to um, have music live and perhaps not perfect than to worry about every detail being in its place. So and when I write, I that's the way I approach it as well. If you think a quote of Mozart belongs in it, stick it in. Um, and that, that's, and even the sounds of the kitchen and the sounds of the house, those are also reflected in your music as well. It was just sort of an influencing patch. I think they do. One isn't always aware of that, I think. But look, when you get someone like Donald who comes and prods in your memory of that, you think, why do you think that way? Mm -hmm. It's those early influences I think are surprisingly important. Yeah. Another question over there. Yeah, I um, just remember meeting you, Martin, uh, in 1990. She has a sex form around the shop with That's the right. Uh, <laughs> that house, and you showed me the uh, current piece you were working on, I think. Um, I don't remember much about it other than that was one of the first schools I'd seen types in Tanale. Oh. And I sort of, I think because of that image, I sort of associated you early with sort of computers and technology and maybe even electronic music, but obviously it hasn't been a huge. But has there been any influence, as Douglas said, later on, from at least thinking electronically or a certain influence from that sound world? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I remember awarding the first prize at Logan Park High School for composition acting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and very well deserved too. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, yes, the influence of electronics from Douglas has come back, and I'm getting increasingly influenced at the moment. I've got a big top secret research project involving VR and some other instruments um, in the process of being formed up. And uh, I think the main breakthrough has come from not regarding electronic music as separate from acoustic music, but regarding it as a continuum, which has been probably a change in the last 10 years. I don't know how you feel about that, but certainly people regard Electronics and live music is much more fluid and intermingled now than was in the past. Previously, there were two very separate streams of study, and I think that's changing now. And of course, the other thing is we live in a very visual culture now. So the internet is primarily visual with sound pretty much secondary, really, I think, if we're honest. So um, the idea of putting video and or images to sound in some way or other is really important as well. So that's an area that I'm moving into at present. Yeah, that was my next question. Was obviously working with Hotrod is a very collaborative experience. Yeah. Working with anyone with Hotrod, of course, is very collaborative. And this is what you just said now suggests another potential collaborative venture in the future. Do you see this as something collaboration with other artists that you have maybe not so much control over as being something that might be a future direction? That was the hardest thing about that piece, Toro, that I wrote was letting go of control. And you think, well, what if they play it wrong? <laughs> Well, they don't get, they don't understand it, then you just have to trust the performers. I found that really difficult as a composer at first, when I was used to writing, you know, dots on pages which are very specific. So, um, 
Richard Nunn has always taught me a number of things, um, and one of them was um, two things about improvisation. He said the two golden rules are, firstly, know when to stop, because people tend to go on too long, and the other one is be careful who you pick to work with, because that will determine your outcome. So collaboration, which is becoming so much more popular for creative work, and for me as well, is, does depend, I think, for its success on choosing the right people to work with. It's more of a human activity than a technical one in the end, because if you need something technical, you learn it, or you find someone who can do it. But to get that energy going, it has to be the right people. So yeah, the projects I'm working on at the moment, <clears throat> I think they're all collaborative. <clears throat> more questions? Well, I think that's a good moment to wrap okay. this up. And thank you very much, Martin, for thank you. your time. <laughs>